This is Steve Zeltzer with Pacific and Workweek. I'm in Osaka, the General Workers Union in Osaka, which represents various workers, and we're here to talk about what they do and who they represent and the kind of struggles that they face. So with the uh, General Secretary here, welcome. My name is Dennis Teslot. I'm the General Secretary of this union. I've been a member since 1994, after I first came to Japan, and I've worked here as a staff person, either part-time or full-time, since 1996 after I was dismissed from my workplace for after we organized a union. So and I just ended up here. And that sounds familiar in the United States because thousands and thousands of workers are fired who even mention the word union and, and they're kicked out of the job. So that happens also in Japan as well. Yeah, it happens here. In our union, it's become, I think, less and less from the 90s when we were first starting. That was a, a different time compared to now, I think. Um, some of the strikes and some of the behaviors of companies um, to frame us up and get us arrested and things like that. Stuff that I don't see now so much in our union, but in other unions, like the, there's been a big dispute of the, of Kanama, uh, the Osaka Namakon Concrete Workers Union. There's a lot of arrests there. People were held, you know, basically for over a year in jail with no trial. So, you know, it still goes on a lot. Our union experience is a little bit different right now, comparatively to them. And what are the issues that your union is facing, your membership? Who do you represent? We have a lot of... When our union was set up, it was never meant to be a union that was sort of majority immigrant worker. It was set up as a... It was set up after... Oh, God, you know, this is gonna, the conversation become longer and longer. <laughs> I'll cut it really short. After, after, after Sohyo and Dome unions merged together to make Rengo, a lot of sort of the new left people broke off to form their own union... And our federation is called um, Zendokyo, is our union federation. So we started there, and this union was set up by an old staff guy from Zenkin, from the Metal and Machinery Workers Union. And he'd left the Metal and Machinery Workers Union when they had joined Dengo. And he set up this union here as sort of a place that anybody, not just full-time regular workers could join, but part-timers, which would mean including a lot of women, immigrant workers, and they set this up. And then you know how it is. One person who works at a language school got helped, and he brought his friend, and they brought two friends, and they brought three friends, and little by little it became a union that dominated basically by foreign workers. Um, so a lot of the issues that we face is that a lot of the industry in the beginning, the feeling towards immigrant foreign workers even though I don't like using the word foreign worker. Gaijin? Yeah, I don't even like the word gaijin. I actually like, I prefer the word immigrant, but foreign worker has been drived into my head. Um, so basically a lot of them thought, well, they're here short time. It doesn't really matter if they have health insurance. It doesn't really matter if we follow the labor standards law. They're only going to be here a little while. So basically when the union started, it was very basic. It was dealing with labor standards complaints. Overtime, no paid holidays, um, you know, things of that, things that very clearly are illegal in the law. But we had to deal with those. When we dealt with those, we started dealing with other issues around insurance. Um, around, the, around the 2000 mark, we started getting more and more university members in the union compared to language teachers that we first started off with. More and more university members. Um, you know, their issues are, you know, they're part-timers, basically. Most of them are. They're as in the United States, yeah, yeah. the adjuncts are a major part of the uh, the uh, university workforce now, yes. college workforce. And here, there's a lot of our members, and you know, they lose classes every year. They go up, they go down. No steady income. Um, often, because they're part timers, they can't be enrolled in any kind of public insurance. Well, they can always be enrolled in public insurance through the the national insurance system, but not through the employer funded system, right? Um, so there's problems around, there's problems around that. Um, Everett works in the universities, actually. Chris comes from language schools. Toshi comes from a, a very varied background, a very varied, very varied political background before, before general union. Um, well, Osaka, uh, I've been here and studied a little bit, was a very militant, uh, mo the most militant industrial workers in Japan. Mm in the post-war period, yes. and had many strikes, and even an occupation, Tanaka Machinery Works, the, the workers, yeah, the, Tanaka. Ta ta Tanaka. Yeah. So it has, it has a tradition. Uh, your union began as an independent union. How, was it a struggle to get going as an independent union in Japan? 
yeah, I, I guess when I when I started there, we didn't have an office, we didn't have a telephone number. Yeah, it was hard. We had other unions that supported our activity, and especially other Japanese people from other unions who you know have experience and knew how to do things. Like we didn't know what to do. We were a bunch of, especially we, a lot of us were a bunch of kids. You know, I, I'm I, I wasn't I wasn't this old when I came. You know, I was a kid when I came. <laughs> So, you know, we don't know what to do. We're organizing a union out of the, you know, out of the air. So a lot of the Japanese unions around us were wonderful in supporting us. And we would have never gotten off the ground, you know. The old chairman was always, it was, a, was one Japanese guy, but one person isn't enough. You need a whole group around you. And so, yeah, it was hard getting off the ground, but luckily we had a lot of support. You know, the first two or three years, different. But after that, things started Progressing. And the idea of a general union, I mean, in, the, in Japan you have a lot of company unions, union by company, uh, and you industry workers are not together in an entire industry. Maybe and company unions. Company unions, yeah. Yeah. So that's, all, that's actually one of the biggest issues. You know, the inside of a company, one union, I wouldn't want to say that they're all not real unions. I would hate to say that. It's probably not true. But it's probably correct in many cases, or in most cases, actually. You know, are, how far are they labor unions compared to what we would consider to be a labor union, right? So we, we, our tradition is that we call ourselves part of the fighting labor union movement compared to distinguish ourselves. And also because we're a general union. We're not based in one company. We're, people are from all over the place. Um, we have a growing group of people that are in the tech industry that are joining the union right now. Actually, we're built a tech workers branch. So little by little bit, people are coming, people are coming towards us. We, we, our tradition is that we call ourselves part of the fighting labor union movement compared to distinguish ourselves. And also because we're a general union. We're not based in one company. We're, people are from all over the place. Um, we have a growing group of people that are in the tech industry that are joining the union right now. Actually, we're built a tech workers branch. So little by little bit, people are coming. People are coming towards us. But this issue of um, sort of the 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 past and things like that. Probably Toshi would probably be the best person to talk to because he's probably more aware of things like Tanaka struggle than I am because I wasn't here then during that time. Well, I I, I visited Tanaka Machine Works. I got their videos, and they they uh, they have a uh, hot spring there for their workers mm. after they're one. I think every American worker should have a hot spring oh, after nice. after you're finished with your work shift, so then you can cool, <laughs> you can just relax and enjoy. And they built a restaurant there. Uh, where workers can, where people can go to the restaurant, but that struggle uh, is is not known in the United States, and the, the fighting spirit of the Japanese workers to protect their union. Maybe you can. Yeah. So do you want? So do you Tanaka? Tanaka. So do you want? 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 So do you So do you want? So do you want? So do you want? So do then, organizationally, I joined this union when it's rather new, 20, 15, eight years ago. Yeah. Of course, I know. So, for example, Mr. Yamahara, he mentioned, I know him from a long time ago when he was deeply involved in the so, Tanaka machine struggle like that. He, he used to be an organizer of Metal Workers Union. And, you know, the Metal Workers Union uh, had a very militant tradition yeah. uh, in Osaka. Yeah. It was the most industrialized part of Japan yes. after the war. And there was, uh, there used to be a law, I don't know if it still z exists, that uh, if a company tries to get rid of a union, yeah. and you can show that, yeah. then you can control the land for 20 years. Yes. And that is amazing for yeah. Americans to even know that a law like that existed. Because if that was the case, probably all the companies in the United States would be owned by the workers. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that kind of tradition still exists. Uh, in other unions, for example, you mentioned, it, it's a, nowadays the union, the labor union composed by a ready mixed you know, the concrete drivers union, it's a, it's, a, it's a very famous in the name of Kanama. They were so depressed by, you know, not, all, not only by the capitalists, 
but also the, the capitalist group used the Yakuza people to crush the union. So Yakuza is cooperating with police <laughs> in crushing that union. That's what's going on now. So this is a very difficult situation for that union then. The, if they jail their members, if they use the gangsters to attack the union, yeah. and they use the courts and, and the government, how does a union survive under those circumstances? Well, basically, first thing, I can clearly say that, mainly because that union has done nothing wrong. Therefore, therefore, more and more, people know the reality. They're getting support more and more. That's the reason why still they survive. Of course, we have been good, good relation with them. And the situation in Japan uh, is uh, that there haven't been wage increases yeah. for a large number of workers for a long time, and prices are going up. Yeah. Uh, so how are workers surviving? How are workers surviving? Oh, it's a good question. Yeah, but of course surviving. But if, if, if you see the reality of the real life of workers, they're getting harder and harder, more and poor. That's the reality. For example, about retirement age, people is encouraging you know, the people, please work more due to your longevity. You can, you can work until 70 years old or more. On one hand, it's a good thing. However, on the other hand, one of the reality is that a lot of workers cannot survive without working, in a sense, forever. Until they die. Yes. That's well, one aspect of the reality of this country. And the other issue, I mean, for Japan and other advanced countries, that, that uh, workers are not having children, and, and women do not want to have children. Yeah. And why is that, that women are, do not want to have the children, and the birth rate is declining as rapidly as it is in Japan? Yeah. As far as I know, answer is, in a sense, complicated, but in a sense, very simple. We can see no bright future. Can I, can I promise, you know, can I promise a wonderful future to my children, to my kids? That that main reason, I think. And the, the idea of a general union is all workers yeah. uh, should be organized in a union. Yeah. The general workers union, I know that there's one in Tokyo, there are other general workers. Are they growing in Japan? In, in general, uh, to be honest, we can say significantly growing, we cannot say. It's a, that's a reality. But, but one thing, steadily, some part are growing. And in general, we can say, at least we can see the potential, a possibility of growing is growing. We are growing. We are growing. For example, this union is growing. And how, how much has your member gone up? Membership gone up? Well, uh, how can how can what what is the way the best way to count the number of a membership? Uh, yeah. Oh, so at this moment we can say uh, between seven and eight hundred currently. This individual joining. You know, people come to our union, they leave our union, they go home, they change jobs, they get deported, you know, <laughs> things like that. Our membership goes up and down, so trying to count the exact number of members often is a very difficult thing. But since the pandemic, our union grew 35%. That's when the doors opened and people from all over the country were calling and we couldn't shut the door. You know, I'm not getting paid, they told me, sorry, you're fired, what do we do? So, God, the pandemic, we were working 18 hours a day during the pandemic, seven days a week for two years. Um, but the membership grew, and those people stayed in the union. 
they didn't just sort of come and get helped and then said sayonara. They stayed in the union, and that's why it grew. It, they believed that the union was their organization to defend themselves. Yeah. So they needed a union. And one of the situations about Japan uh, and Korea, for that matter, is that the government now says that they want to bring in immigrant workers. Yeah. And uh, foreign workers. Foreign workers. Not immigrants. Oh, I see. No, For, Japan, foreign workers. No immigration <laughs> policy. <laughs> That's right. And they're very clear about that. The government is clear. Japan has no immigration policy. People can come to work, and maybe they can stay, but they're not immigrants. So, so this idea of. Uh, unlike the United States. But there's a struggle in the United States about immigration. There are people who would like to take citizenship away from people who were even born in the United yeah, States. Yeah. So, but the, the pressure now on the government is that the capitalists need workers. That's They're right. desperate for workers. And so there's a, a push for new workers, but they don't want to provide the workers the rights and, and the, that other workers have. Is that the case? Yeah, they need workers. They know they need workers. They've just changed some of the parts of this trainee system of people coming in. Is they were supposed to come in? It was a it, when it started. It was supposed to be an exchange, basically. They would come to Japan, learn new skills and technology, and then bring that technology back to their own countries. No, they ended up sweeping the floor and doing the dirtiest jobs and things like that. Then there's been numerous different kinds of programs set up but all set up as they want skilled workers to do a certain job. And even then when the skilled workers come, they're not doing often skilled jobs, you know? So they're treated to a certain extent. The trainee program for the first year, you can't change jobs. So you're like an indentured servant. For the first year, yeah. And before that, it wasn't even the first year. Now it's become the first year. Before that, you weren't allowed to change jobs. They would send you home. So we often, we sometimes in the past have dealt with Chinese workers at textile plants up in the, the Nagoya Aichi area around there, um, other places at this um, uh, machine shop. Oh, this is a long time ago. You guys won't even remember this. Some, it was some aeronautics factory. There was a bunch of Filipino workers working there. Even I sort of don't remember it because um, it was that long ago. So, yeah, it's trying to get... We're in a different, if you notice us being white, we're in a little bit of a different situation as, as immigrant workers in Japan compared to workers coming from Southeast Asia and stuff like that. So we're in a bit of a different boat, but still, you know, we're not, we're not really, we're sort of temporary regardless of how long we've been here. So that's a dangerous situation to be in. I mean, in a, a, a vulnerable situation. And I know in the hotel industry, uh, there are more and more immigrant workers, yes. uh, women, large numbers of immigrant workers. Uh, are they even represented? And is that, are they coming to your union to, to get support? Is that We just set up a group at a hotel a little while ago. Four people. <laughs> yes. Four people. That's where we start. It's not like in a, America where you, you get 50% and then you go from there and you have a union shop. And No, it starts with one person, then two people, three people. I've gotten organizing meetings where I'm the only one. <laughs> You know, it really is building something out of nothing, one person at a time. It's that, it's that level. So when we say seven, 800 and we're growing, I know American unions, like, what do you mean we got 10 million workers in the UAW or whatever? Yeah, yeah. for the real labor movement in Japan, no. it's individual joiners, people that aren't represented, even if there's a union in their company, Often they're not able to join that union because they're not what's called say shine, right? Regular workers. So uh, being a regular worker, you're saying that if you're a migrant worker or an immigrant worker, you're treated differently than a regular worker. Or a one-year Japanese contract worker or a Japanese dispatched worker. Um, they were always used to fill the cracks in the system, right? Not enough people at Toyota. We need 10 people for a year. But now it's become permanent. There's a 40% of the workforce now is irregular workers. So and what about the what about difference. the what about the major unions like at a company like Toyota? They have a union that's supposed to represent those workers. Uh, is it representing those temporary workers? And that's an issue in the United States. It's an issue in the auto industry all over the world. I know in the United States, contract workers, temporary workers. You have a situation at auto plants at GM where you have two two separate contracts for workers workers doing the cleanup. And, and we're the unions at Toyota, 
and all I don't want to say I don't want to say bad things about other unions <laughs> because that's not my way of doing things. But no, they take care of the regular workers. Are they fighting that all workers should have equal rights on the job? I mean, in other words, in the United States, it's a major issue. You have a worker doing the same job as another worker, but they're making 30% less without the benefits. That's part of privatization, contracting out, uh, subcontracting. Even public workers, they're getting rid of public workers and bringing in nonprofit workers who do the same work at 30% less for it without the, uh, ben uh, the benefits of public workers. That's is, being an irregular worker in Japan. And is that growing? Yes, yeah. So according to the government data, out of all the trade unions in Japan, in Japan, majority union you know, does not allow irregular workers to join their unions. Union is only for regular workers. But if the whole economy is changing, and workers, companies do not want to have regular permanent workers yeah. because they have to give them benefits and conditions. Uh, aren't, how are unions reacting to that? Because their actual membership must be declining. And the other issue is AI and automation and technology, which is affecting workers. But so, therefore, I'm inside of Rengo, so-called the biggest union federation in Japan, some, just some part of you know, unions in private sector is organizing yeah, such kind of regular workers, then they have been successful. Yes. But as a whole, situation is, as I told you. Then that's one of the reasons why general union is, has been growing. We are open. My wife started working part-time in a supermarket, and all of a sudden she got this note from the union and she's like, well, what's this? And I said, well, I said, probably it's a union shop. You probably don't know about it, but I said, it's a union shop. And a you, secret union shop. Well, but the good thing is, is that even as a part-timer, she was included into the bargaining unit. So both my wife and my kids are members of UA Zen Zen now. Um, but years ago, probably, part-timers wouldn't have been invited into the union. So UA, this union here, has a good idea. They realize that if we don't organize part-time workers, and maybe they don't do it in the most right way, that's another story, but if we don't organize part-timers, well, we're going to go away. So, and her union dues are something like, I don't know, like like 200 or 300 yen a month or something like that. Yeah. Hey, my name is Chris Nimata. I'm a vice chair for private language industries. So basically all the language schools is my area of focus right now. Yeah. And there's been a long struggle of language uh, schools in Japan, uh, exploitation. It's the same in the United States as well. My union has been involved in organizing uh, language school workers. Um, and uh, these schools have gone bankrupt. Uh, the, the, the workers in these schools are highly exploited and, and really are in dangerous because they're fear of their jobs and, and also the visas and that, that whole thing. What is the situation of your struggle and your union struggle to defend language school workers? Well, to be honest with you, I've been really fortunate in my life that I haven't had a whole lot of personal struggles. Um, I worked at the same company for a very long time, and the only reason that I left was because I didn't have much of a um, much of an opportunity to move up at that point. I kind of hit the glass ceiling, as it were, and that's the biggest problem for a lot of long-term workers in language schools. Here is you are a contract worker and you don't really have much beyond that. And if you're looking to make a life here in Japan. It's, after a certain point, it can become demotivating and hard to want to continue to teach at a language school, right? Um, so a lot of what drives me in organization is creating more opportunities for long-term employment for workers, um, and having better benefits as you get older, and having the chance to create a life and have enough money to raise a family. Um, you were talking a little bit earlier about wage stagnation, and that's a huge problem in the language school industry. Wages haven't just not moved since the 90s. They've gone down in a lot of places. Um, so really, in order to encourage people to want to continue to live in Japan, in order to want to have a family here, wages do need to go up. And in a way, yeah, it's very much exploitation, but 
part of the problem is that if wages don't go up, there's just higher and higher turnover, which is, I think, what kind of the companies want to see to some degree. Um, there was, I know there was one company a few years back that said uh, that they do want to see their workers turn over faster because when you get fresh faces in, they're so excited to be in Japan, and that's what their students want. They don't want a teacher at the end of the day. They want somebody that's going to sell the idea of how cool it is to be international. Um, but the fact is there are a lot of people here that do want to immigrate as much as Japan would like the opposite of that. Um, so for people like myself who are planning to be here long term, and I am married and my husband's Japanese, um, and I do would like to raise a family at some point, but uh, for people like me who are planning to be here long term, what are our options? Um, and that's something that I'm personally working toward improving is the quality of life for long-term people. And at the same time, I'm um, supporting those who are here short-term in having, in not being exploited and in having livable wages um, in spite of all the benefits that might come from being here uh, compared to where they might come from. And there have been uh, numerous immigration struggles here where in one woman, uh, Sri Lankan woman, died. And, and is that a concern to you and your members, uh, the situation of immigration, the threat of possibly being incarcerated and, and pushed push back to your country? Yeah, it's definitely a concern that I hear from some people. Um, a lot, I think part of the difficulty in organizing at this point is people are afraid to speak out and afraid. The same in the United States exactly. for fear that you'll get fired. Well, I, I see from the language industry, a lot of people join because they want to protect their rights. And if there is a problem, um, they know somebody that they can talk to, right? They see the union as more of an insurance policy than as something that they're actively engaging in. And that's something too that I want to try to change a little bit. But yeah, people are afraid to be active because they don't want to get deported. They do want to, well, they want to live here, but more than anything else, I think people just don't like to get in trouble. <laughs> they don't like to make waves. Um, and being involved in a union, it's kind of funny to say that, but it's the truth, I think, for a lot of people in the language school industry. And in Japan, um, there is a saying that uh, if you're a nail that sticks up, you'll get pounded down. <laughs> And, and, and that leads to a situation where people keep quiet even though they're suffering. And is that, you feel that that's a, the case as far as the treatment of workers? I feel that that's the case for some people. I think that things have been changing a little bit. And maybe it's just the people that I'm exposed to. Um, but sometimes nails are pretty stubborn. Sometimes nails are actually screws and they can't get pounded back down. Um, so I think that's what happens a lot when you get involved with the union, at least with this union, is we are a very stubborn group. Um, and the people that are around me, I've been very fortunate that they've been supportive in helping to push people up. And uh, at the end of the day, yeah, it's tough and it's scary sometimes for some people, but um, I like to think that with the younger generation of Japanese people at least, that mentality that if you stand out you're going to get pushed back down is changing. And maybe that's partially because of the influence of foreigners in Japan, right? There are a lot more foreigners here than there were even 15 years ago, right? Um, so the mentality of internationalism, the mentality that someone is different being not necessarily a bad thing, I like to think is uh, changing for the better. And I mean, young people in the United States are in motion. Uh, many of them are joining unions. Many of them also see socialism. Uh, they don't see a future in capitalism because of the, what's happening. Uh, teachers, others, I mean, yeah. young people uh, are want to have a future. Is that the same situation in Japan? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I don't think that it's weird for me to say because I, I think I'm one of the youngest people in this room right now, actually. <laughs> actually, yeah, I am the youngest person in this room right now. Um, but when I look at people younger than me, I'm constantly impressed um, by how motivated they are toward their future and how intensely they think of their future. Because when I was in my 20s, I was still very 
wow, I'm in Japan, this is so cool. Um, and my day to day was just, I didn't know where I was gonna be in five years. I didn't even think about it really. I had a vague plan of what I wanted to do, but um, my sister is 22 and she, yes, 22, <laughs> I had to think about that. Um, and she impresses me so much with what she kind of, she already kind of knows what she wants to do with her life. Um, she hasn't made a set plan for it yet, but she kind of has an idea of where she wants to be in 15, 20 years, which is astounding to me. And I think a lot of young people in the States are like that. Maybe they don't know about, maybe they aren't thinking about themselves personally, but I do see a lot more younger people thinking about the future and seeing that things need to change because the path that we're on right now isn't where isn't one that's going to put them in the best position when they're in their middle age. And one of the major issues now in the United States and globally is social media. Uh, TikTok is being blamed uh, for communism. It's being blamed for subverting people. But actually what's happened to TikTok is being used by young people to talk about their conditions. And more and more workers are using TikTok to say, this is outrageous what I'm facing. Is that happening in Japan? Um, I can't speak very much for TikTok because I'll be honest that I spend more time on YouTube. <laughs> That's more my generation, yeah. Um, but I do see, I think that just social media is causing more conversation about these things. I don't want to blame TikTok directly because TikTok is just the the current iteration of Vine, of YouTube, of Facebook, of MySpace, of anything that happened before, of IRC. IL IRC, yeah. I ILC is a <laughs> different one, isn't it? <laughs> and well, I know, I mean, YouTube, one of the things that has happened with YouTube is uh, Japanese uh, uh, go travel around the world, have tours, Koreans mm -hmm. travel to Japan, there, there's this exchange exactly. that, that hasn't been possible in the history Right. Uh, of the world where people from different countries can communicate worldwide and globally and, and for language teachers yeah. to be able to be part of that. Yes, that's, that's actually been really exciting to me because I think in this current age of globalization, we're seeing, it's, it's not just that we're seeing more people interacting with different cultures in different countries, but we're seeing younger and younger people being exposed to these things. And I think that's really what's been affecting these changes in where people are looking looking toward their futures because they're seeing how things are done in different countries. Not just what's happening in their personal communities, but what is happening in their country, what's happening in their in other countries nearby, and what's happening in the world. And that causes them to care more than they ever have before about these changes that are going on and how they might be affecting it or how they might be able to affect it. And the idea of internationalism. Mm -hmm the idea that you're connected. And in fact, these companies are all over the world. I mean, you work, or your workers in uh, language work for companies that are global companies. They're all over the world. Yeah. Do, you, do you have relations with, with other workers in other countries who work for the same company? I don't personally, I haven't. Um, but the, I do know, um, I have several friends who are with international companies. Um, I have a friend recently who just got a job. She was working in Japan for a few years. Um, and then she was actually in a language school and she decided to go home. But before she went home, a company in her hometown said, hey, wait a second, we're opening a branch in Japan. Would you like to interview for that position? So now she goes back and forth between Japan and the U.S. as part of her job. Um, I know that uh, certain companies, certain language schools like Berlitz, for example, it's an international company. So they have a lot more relationships with people going back and forth between the states, um, Europe and the US, uh, and Japan, sorry. <laughs> um, so seeing that kind of internationalism happening at a business level, but also making people more interested in um, jobs that might have them traveling or jobs that might have them interacting with um, people from other countries. And I know that in Japan, that's been a big push for a long time um, in terms of the language schools, right? Our students, our adult students, by and large, would be business people who need to speak English to talk with people, to talk with foreigners. Now, these days we have Zoom, we have social, uh, we have online services that will translate everything for us. So there's less and less of a need for it. And in spite of that, you still see more and more people um, 
taking English classes to be able to communicate. But it's not just business people anymore. It's housewives who want to make friends through social media. It's young people who want to travel overseas um, and visit London or, or Perth or something. Um, it's not, it, it, it's a lot more balanced which is really interesting to see that kind of transition happen. And, and one of the issues, American workers, workers all over the world, Goldman Sachs has said that 350 million workers uh, might lose their job as a result of AI. Is this, uh, and San Francisco is the center of it, uh, artificial intelligence with the purpose uh, and goal of getting rid of workers, translators, teachers, and, and having AI uh, do what, workers are doing for interpreters i mean this is a major issue for other workers you know is this yeah it's definitely been a concern in the language school industry a little bit i know that um universities and colleges also has ha has had quite a lot of talk about how this is going to affect um how it's going to affect teachers especially um one thing that companies i see have been trying to do is get ahead of that by incorporating ai into their um, into their companies as much as possible. Um, some have developed apps where they encourage students to use the app to practice using um, to practice speaking with an AI um, to get feedback on their pronunciation, to practice just conversations and dialogues and things like that. But what I think has been shown as a result of these apps being created is that it's still not in a place where it's ready to replace an actual classroom. Um, and at the same time as we see these AI tools being developed, we're also seeing how we can take advantage of that development in the classroom and use it as a supplement rather than as a replacement. And as we continue to use it as a supplement, we're still able to show customers, clients, whoever you want to talk about, that there is still a need for the positions that exist as they are. The so a human being is still required? Oh, absolutely. Well, I mean, I, I, was, I, w I worked at my former company. I was, I was an English teacher for, I was an English teacher for 13 years at the same company. And uh, so I have a lot of care about the importance of a real person. And it's something that I have given a lot of consideration to. My name is Ever Morrison. Um, I'm also a vice chair. Um, and I work in the universities and colleges sector. And the situation in the United States, many countries that you, you have adjuncts who are underpaid. More and more jobs are done by adjuncts uh, as a way of saving money. And there have been strikes. I know in California, uh, the graduate students you see, uh, graduate students went on strike. They can't live they can't survive. Is, is that a similar situation in Japan? It's similar, but it's less dire. The, the systems are similar in that adjuncts uh, being part-timers, they don't have the tenure, they don't have the security. And that's one of the, that's one of the biggest three problems that we face in, in our sector. The term limited contracts or the unlimited term contracts. So uh, to get people in our sector the, the security that they need, they, they need to have worked, if they're adjunct or if they're part-timers, they need to have worked into their sixth year or one contract past their fifth year. And at that time, they can convert from a term limited contract to an unlimited term contract. But universities are making a, a big effort to keep people from getting there. They will, they will put into the contract that this is a five-year limited term contract so that they can't convert over to that. So that's one of the biggest things that we work on is trying to inform our members that they are eligible for this and tell other people in the universities, you may be eligible for this and help them through the process of, of uh, converting. And is that legal to uh, basically prevent workers from becoming permanent by getting rid of them? Uh, yeah, that's a tough one to answer. It's the the contract is is legally binding. If they tell you up front this is a five year contract and and you can't um, you can't uh, work beyond that, then then it's legal. But there's another problem that we have, and that's what we call the uh, term uh, term of office law. And this is where uh, projects that have taken a long time within the schools um, sometimes will take. Research will take more than five years, up to 10 years, to complete. 
And so they will hire people on to do in, in these kind of contracts. So, so this will be a 10-year limited contract. And, uh, and then at that point, they won't convert them to an unlimited term contract. But a lot of schools are uh, going against the spirit of this law by hiring people on to these 10-year limited contracts, but they're not using them for the sake of the, the actual purpose of that, that type of contract, which requires research. They're not researchers. They're just adjuncts. They're just teachers, and they're hiring on to in these contracts, but not doing that work, and then saying, no, we, we won't renew you after that. And, I mean, the quality of education, which we want to improve, I mean, if you have adjuncts, they're in a worse situation, and they're in a vulnerable situation, and a stressful situation. Is it harming public education? Is it harming the education process? Of course. Uh, if you don't have people who are allowed to stay, then they can't develop as well in their jobs. The longer they stay, the more experience they have, um, the, the more they know the institution, the better that they can, they can serve the, uh, the students who come through and, and uh, be good uh, members of the, of the institution. But turning over, turning over every five years keeps, keeps people from gaining that experience, and so it doesn't serve the institution or the students. And what about the regular unions that represent uh, faculty in universities in Japan, both private and public? The, the other, uh, other types of unions, um, they often have management who will rotate uh, into those positions. So managers of the school, HR managers or, or other uh, managers, they will rotate into the, um, the uh, management of the union, the internal unions. And, and then they'll rotate back out. So they don't have, I don't think they have the vested interest in serving the community of, of uh, union workers because they have their own interest in getting into uh, a stable position within the company outside of the union work. So uh, internal, internal unions don't, don't serve as well as, as I think our type of union does, which is why I think our union is so useful. And one of the things, I had the experience here of visiting a factory, a Nissan factory, which was uh, going to be actually closed. And I went into the factory to, to interview the union. They said, oh, no, it's not closing. <laughs> that was the, the company's position was it was not a closure, you know. So actually, I was, I was surprised because it was closing, and yet the, the union representative was saying it was not closing. Really? So they, they were just denying it? They were denying it. Yeah. Because that was the company's position. The company's position, right, and you have to tell the company line. Yeah. Um, we, have, we have similar in the, um, similar concerns in the industry uh, where because of the declining uh, population, um, fewer students who are going into universities. In the United States, uh, tech workers are organizing Google, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Apple. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what is happening in Japan with, with tech workers and are they joining your union? Yes, they are. And they're joining in, in greater numbers than other, other um, sectors. Um, like I was saying with the, uh, the declining birth rate and declining amount of people going into universities, uh, we are not seeing the growth as the tech sector is. So we are, um, we're getting more tech workers, and interestingly, we're getting them in larger uh, amounts within a workplace. Whereas with a, with a university, we may get three, four, five uh, at a time. Um, tech workers jo are joining in, in greater numbers together. They're talking to each other, which is kind of ironic because tech workers you'd think are kind of, you know, they can do their own thing, um, but they're, they're banding together and they're coming together in greater numbers. And I mean, this has, I think, also to do social media, mm -hmm. signal, mm -hmm. other telegram workers are organizing. Right. And you can't see it on the surface, but underneath, right. workers yeah. are communicating. They are. And I, I think that's because they use the, the social media more frequently and they have more uh, avenues of communication, they're, they're banding together through those means. So that must be an exciting process. Yeah, watching people who are new to Japan coming over, uh, especially in Tokyo, where there's a lot of uh, tech work, joining through those companies is, is a lot of fun to see. So you are, uh, sound like you're optimistic about the growth of your union? Yes, the, the dynamic is changing, but the growth is, is happening. And, and you were talking before about the, the plight of immigrants. The growth of our union is, is hitting an interesting phase right now in, in that 
We're starting to not only represent our members, but we're starting to provide opportunities for discussion beyond, beyond just our membership. The last two years we've, we've offered symposiums for, for people to join and participate and we've had um, expert speakers and we've had people who have had different kinds of experience, uh, atypical experiences. A, a woman who works as a truck driver and it, within a male dominated field, having her be able to talk about her experience. Having a, somebody who came to Japan as an asylum seeker talking about her experience. So we as a, we as a union we're starting to grow beyond just our membership and are starting to provide education and resources to other people. So people in Osaka should join your union. That's right. That's right. It's the best one.